The year was 2012. A website known as YouTube would see an explosion in popularity due to people playing video games and reacting very funny to them. And hey, if you need to get a loud screech out of your mouth so people can laugh, well, games based on those internet legends known as Creepypasta was your ticket to stardom. Hello people, I'm a wizard named Slickback. And happy November 1st. And on this spooky November 1st night, we're gonna be delving back into creepy pastas and going through the video games associated with them. So sit down, get cozy, as we go through a few spooky games. There is no better place to start than the granddaddy of creepy pastas and one of the most iconic horror games of the early 2010s Slender the Eight. Pages. You're dropped into a forest with one task, collecting eight pages. Although it sounds easy enough, you'll quickly find out that you're being watched by one of the scariest entities in history. A white man. This game's simple premise and scary setting led it to being one of the earliest games to become popular due to online exposure. Today there are many games that become titans off of a big name playing them to millions of fans, but back then, a game getting popular with no marketing or not being an established franchise was unheard of. But what about the game itself? Well, it's a little thing we in the show business call very okay. Back in the day when you were like an 11 year old kid, this shit's scary. But eight years later, you grow some hair on your chest, both figuratively and literally, and now this game is not scary at all. But an even worse feeling sets in. Boredom. You waddle your slow ass around, collecting scraps of paper off of trees, cars, and abandoned architecture, while this Caucasian is stalking you. I've played this game for about an hour, and based on my experience with it, you are never gonna die by being jump scared. In the beginning, the Slender Man is only going to be creeping up from behind and very rarely showing up from behind a tree. The point of this is you're supposed to get jump scared and startled by the loud sounds, causing you to stop moving your mouse and keyboard, which is how he gets you. But that never happens because he's not scary. But this then leads to the game's biggest strength and most annoying feature. The forest is absolutely fantastic for a game like this. You can and will get lost in this natural labyrinth and find yourself at landmarks you previously explored many times. This is a great setting, but it's because of the forest maze that the most annoying thing happens. You see, I said you were never going to die by getting jump scared by the Slender Man, but you are most certainly going to get killed by him because you couldn't find a page fast enough. This happened on every run of the game I did, and it was so stupid. I get that's a way for you to remember where every landmark is and beat the game over multiple runs, but it is just so demoralizing to die like this and having to start over and slowly creep back towards these locations. And sometimes without even a page being there because they are random each time, it just makes me not want to finish it. And good luck finding shit when you lose your flashlight. Why is this in the game? In the end, Slender the Eight Pages is a flawed but still enjoyable time waster. If you played the game as a kid back in the day or want a quick horror experience, this might be the game for you. Well, we're back to Pokemon much sooner than expected, with Pokemon Black version gracing our presence years before the release of the actual Pokemon Black version. And this is your stereotypical haunted cartridge story. I talked about the creepypasta last year, but now we can actually play the game, and it's your classic Pokemon ROM hack experience. Turn up the speed, and watch as your little ghost buddy murders everything in its path. I don't have much to say about this one, your ghost can't take damage, and your move one-shots everything. After you kill the trainer's Pokemon, you can then curse the trainer themselves and kill them, leaving a tombstone in their spot. Any NPC that can be battled can be killed, and this can cause certain puzzles to be swept through. For example, if you kill this guy who typically blocks you from fighting Giovanni, all you gotta do is kill him and walk past him before his tombstone appears. We can vanquish any gym leader, even our number one stoner rep Erica, and you can kill the Elite Four and your own rival after crushing his dreams of being champion. 
At the end of the game, you're an old man and you're free to walk around and see the tombstones of the trainers you cursed. You can then walk back to your house where you go through a montage of all the Pokemon and trainers you killed before being killed by your own ghost. And yes, I did play through all of Pokemon Red just for this one single change at the end. You may say the gameplay is bad and boring since all you're doing is pressing one button. And you're right. But you gotta give it to the creator because this is a very faithful adaptation of the creepypasta. In fact, it's probably the most faithful adaptation of a video game creepypasta. If you crank up the speed of the game and your knowledge of the layout of Gen 1 Kanto, you can knock this game out in about an hour and 15 minutes. So good job, Pokemon Black version. You adapted a story that described awful gameplay into game form. Let's stick with Pokemon because I want to talk about Escape from Lavender Town, a mostly forgotten game that I remember from the golden age of creepypastas. This is a fan game based on the Lavender Town Syndrome myth, another thing I talked about last Halloween. It's a very, very short game. If you wanted to speedrun it, you could beat it in like 45 seconds, but doing that, you'll miss all the funny quips the Lavender Town residents have to say, like the name raider wanting to move, or this lady telling you you'll get brain damage, or this random guy who just says, I have a terminal illness. All right, buddy. But you're supposed to exit the game by pressing the escape key, where it does the fake out close, gets all distorted with images popping up, and doing the old PC gaming trick of saying the name of whatever your PC is called. Unfortunately, my name is not DJ St, but close enough. After that, the creator thanks us, and that's that. A short game based on a really funky story. If you have five minutes to spare, you can give the game a try, but we've talked about the Pokemon games long enough. Let's jump over to another franchise where its fans want to fuck animals. I cannot talk about Sonic.exe with a straight face. So this game is another one of the stories of the haunted game cartridge that is demonic and evil. Like Slenderman, this game got quite a lot of exposure back in the day. But what I wanted to talk about was my personal experience of playing this game to get footage for it. You see, what I didn't know before playing this game was that I must have downloaded some fan update because this adds a couple of new features. The first being that there's voice acting. So many souls to play with. So little time. Would you agree? This voice acting is so laughably terrible that it completely destroys any horror elements this game is going for. It almost makes you excited to see Sonic in order to hear the shitty demon voice they gave him. Other than that, it's the same game up until the end, which is where it went from a slight humor to comedy gold. In the original Sonic.exe, after the three characters Tails, Knuckles, and Dr. Robotnik are brutally murdered, you get this classic early 2010s Sonic horror image. This isn't scary to anyone past the age of 12, but it does give that childhood trauma a good kick in the nuts. In this new version of the game, the image is changed to this. Seeing this pop up on my screen was so funny, I had to pull out my phone and record myself. What the fuck is this? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I cried while playing a video game, but Sonic.exe brought me to goddamn tears because I thought it was so funny. So as a Halloween game, it fails miserably, but please play this game, it's less than 10 minutes long, and it's a masterpiece in shitty 2010's creepypastas. And honestly, it is one of my favorite gaming experiences of 2023. Please play this game. But also, Sonic.exe would cause an explosion in these .exe games where fun, child-friendly characters are all screwed up and evil and killing people and not looking both ways when crossing the street. So despite my criticism of Sonic.exe, these other exe games are worse and not nearly as funny. 
Last year, I talked about the story of an arcade cabinet named Polybius, and during that discussion, I also talked about how much I thought the story itself was a little bit completely fucking stupid. But that hasn't stopped people from taking the story and trying to create a visual representation of the infamous black arcade cabinet. So tonight, I want to discuss two games called Polybius, starting with the Atari 2600. You play as something, doing something, in order to get somewhere, and there's a number at the bottom. However, this game is sinister, because as you play the game, random words that typically have negative connotations appear, like death, pain, and car. This game was made for the Portland Retro Gaming Expo and had a very limited run. It's an interesting way to make Polybius, but it's not exactly anything exciting. The other game I want to talk about is Polybius for the PS4 and PC. I consider this the complete opposite of the Atari game. The only reason you'd play the Atari game is because it's called Polybius, but personally, I think this PS4 version gets weighed down by making itself affiliated with the story. This game takes the crazy sensory overload with the rainbow and neon visuals, with crazy arcade sound effects. It's not some hidden gem masterpiece, but it is by far the most quality game here, and really didn't need to tie itself with some shitty early 2000s internet myth. Not much else to talk about, it's a pretty decent shoot 'em up that you can get on Steam for $7. And that's just a small portion of creepypasta video games, but looking back, despite most of these games less than stellar quality, they were made by very small teams and most likely just one person. The setting of Slender the Eight Pages, the fatefulness of Pokemon Creepy Black, and even the very odd cultural impact of Sonic.exe. These games left an impression on those who were just sitting down and watching YouTube videos back in the early 2010s, and those games will forever be a part of that time period. And that's another successful November 1st, which means I have to tease another video game to play three months from now. So... The Da Vinci Code, coming on January 9th, 2024.